Hi, everyone. Um, many thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, this is an important moment for us, as in just under a month, we will be electing leaders all over the country. And who gets elected will make a difference to the people on the ground, their day-to-day -day lives, their ability to survive as a cost of living crisis grips the country. And so just to make the point that these local elections matter, so thank you for joining us tonight, um, where we're gonna be discussing some critical issues around them. And speaking of the current crisis, this comes after decades of Tory neglect that has left councils weak to cope at the best of times. I don't have to tell any of you that the increased centralization of power away from local authorities, years of public spending cuts, and the move to outsource service provision to the private sector have left our local authorities hollowed out and depleted. Our communities have suffered as a result. But councils are not powerless. They are political, there are political decisions that they can make and a great deal can be done at the local level to bring about progressive economic change. Councils that have an understanding that, and that are willing to tackle the structural issues that caused this decline in the first place can bring about positive change. And many of the leading lights of community wealth building and local government, such as councils in Preston and North Ayrshire, who we have represented on this call today and other fantastic councillors that are with us, have demonstrated this concretely on the ground. By tackling the direct cause of decline through building uh, direct community ownership and control of the local economy, through the ownership of assets, the end of outsourcing, the redirection of public spending towards locally and collectively owned businesses and, union, and a unionized workforce, and the recirculation of wealth locally, community wealth building has been shown to actually work to turn around declining communities and increase the wealth of local communities. Community wealth building is also an important plank in any project to take on a social, racial, gender and climate, um, to take on that, those injustices through building council owned wind power as they're doing in North Ayrshire and through demanding fair employment practices and supporting unionized labor. So it's also vital for a Green New Deal and a just transition. Real municipal socialism, community wealth building is about public services being delivered by a strong, well-funded and democratically accounted public se sector. It supports insourcing. Goods and services which can't be deli delivered directly from the public sector are procured from co-ops or other democratic ownership models within the democratic economy. However, we are now seeing politicians and pundits talking about community power in a vague sense, reducing community control to watered down consultation sessions or assemblies instead of actual ownership and control of the economy. This is a co-option of the language around community power that instead seeks to push communities to form dependence on democratically unaccountable local charities that will replace public services instead of improving and investing in the accountability of those, those public services. These methods leave the reasons for local decline untouched and distract us with feel good words and projects without meaningful structural change or meaningful results. The need to create a strong understanding of what community wealth building is, is partly why we felt it was so important to provide new councillors with this toolkit that we are launching today. To explain how and why community wealth building works in places where it has been shown to really transform the fortunes of communities. What are the key features? What kinds of policies, systems and structures do you need in place to really make it work? As a result, Momentum decided to develop a comprehensive toolkit for councillors on community wealth building and a training programme to accompany this in collaboration with the Democracy Collaborative, who have years of experience researching and supporting local leaders to implement, it, implement these tried and tested methods. But Momentum is at our best when we take ideas and we run with them, organise around them, mobilise networks. So based on this work, we will be running training sessions for interested councillors based on the toolkit after the May elections, including the hundreds of councillors that are in Momentum's councillors network, to build up their understanding, and their skills, and to be able to push for transformational community wealth building programmes across the country at the council level. Some councils will be harder to advance this in than others, and we are planning to provide accompanying support to councillors to get direct support and guidance from new economy experts to get them help in their work. 
So looking to the near future, we want to also build the power of our movement to push for and be part of community wealth building and strong councils on the ground. Our support for socialist councillors committed to their communities doesn't stop on the doorstep and activists and organizers, organizers can play a powerful role. Momentum is also very keen to see how we can get activists and communities on the ground to campaign for community wealth building and other progressive policies that councillors are pushing. For future activities, we'll be looking at how we can work with our local groups and other interested activists to build up their understanding and activism on community wealth building. There's a huge potential for local activists and communities to organize for change at the local, no, local level in a number of different ways, both including and beyond community wealth building. And we'd like to support you to be better change agents on the ground. So we've seen what happens when we select when we elect socialists that really care about their communities and actually understand the reasons for local economic and social decline. We have tools to build up new councillors, knowledge and capacity to do the same. Change must come at different levels and there is a huge potential for us to make change at the local level in, in many places across the country. And that's where all of you come in. With the elections happening in May, we need to make sure we get Labour candidates who are committed to real change elected. They are putting themselves on the line. They're ready to do the work to shift the system, but they can't do it alone and it is our job to help them. So tonight we will hear from, from some great existing councillors and council candidates from across the country. We will also hear about how we can help to get them elected and then support them in their work to serve struggling communities and build a new economy on the ground. So first off, I'd like just like to welcome the speakers who will be um, Aidan um, Dickadem, Aidan Dickadem, who is a campaigner and Labour councillor in Queenstown, Battersea. Then we'll have Matt White, a Labour councillor in Haringey, and a momentum-backed candidate for Labour's NEC councillor place in elections this summer. Next up, we'll also have Joe Cullinan, a Labour councillor and leader of North Ayrshire Council. We'll also hear from Matthew Brown, Labour councillor, leader of Preston City Council and a senior fellow at the Democracy Collaborative. Matthew was also involved in the development of our new community wealth building toolkit that I mentioned, and we'll give a councillor's perspective on that. We will also finally hear from Momentum's National Secretary, Shanali Bhattacharya, about the potential for activists to make real change at the ground level. At the end, we'll also have some time um, for a bit of question, question and answers from around 8 p.m. onwards. So please put any questions that you have as we go along in the comment box, and then we'll try to answer as many of those as we can. So, as I mentioned, we're going to be hearing from two candidates in this year's elections about why they are standing and what they are standing for. First, we'll hear from Aiden, who is a tireless campaigner, community organizer, and Labour councillor in Queenstown Ward in Wandsworth, which Labour are aiming to take off the Tories. Since winning a safe Tory seat in 2016, Aiden has been a bold voice for anti-racism and housing justice, and he holds the housing brief in the Labour team. Welcome, Aiden. Hey, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to get to speak alongside uh, such an amazing panel of guests tonight on such an important uh, political topic. Um, and yeah, and thank you for the intro, Guy. Um, my name is Ivan Deacon. I'm a councillor in a borough called Wandsworth, uh, which is an area I've lived in pretty much my entire life uh, in central southwest London. Um, and it's made up of the constituencies of uh, Tootin, Putney, and Battersea. And Battersea is where I live. Um, and for 44 years, this borough has been run by the Tories. Uh, so I think it's fitting on a call about municipal socialism to kind of start from the complete opposite and talk about what we have been fighting against. Uh, so Wandsworth is known as Thatcher's favourite council, and it's the jewel in the crown of Conservative local government. There's an amazing GLA pamphlet um, from the early 1980s called Municipal Monetarism, which analysed what at the time uh, were seen as these kind of strange new right wing policy ideas, such as outsourcing, privatisation, you know, lean and mean service provision, things that we're all now sadly familiar with. Um, and so, you know, in many ways, municipal neoliberalism really was born in Wandsworth. Um, and none uh, more so than in its housing policies, which is the kind of area that I focus on. Um, they launched the right to buy scheme before it was national policy. Uh, they refused to replace the properties that were sold. They led the way in selling vacant council homes to letting agencies rather than housing homeless families in them. 
uh, they accomplished mass privatization of entire estates as well as demolitions. Um, and under the ones of Tories, the Boris Council housing stock decreased by at least 24,000 properties. So some of you who follow the big developers and their kind of machinations in, in London in particular may have heard of the infamous property lobbyist Peter Bingle. Uh, well, of course, he was a former Wandsworth councillor. He bragged that his aim was to reduce the number of council properties in Wandsworth from 35,000 to 20,000 and make it a conservative constituency. You know, they talked openly about this in committees. Um, some of you may have heard of Wandsworth's former leader, Edward Lister, who, um, you know, had an illustrious career after leaving Wandsworth. First as an advisor to Boris Johnson in City Hall when he was uh, mayor of London, and then becoming the chairman of Homes England, which is a kind of public body tasked with funding affordable homes. Um, and during his time there, it was discovered that he had accepted donations totaling nearly half a million pounds from a Malaysian property development firm, which he had failed to declare. Um, it was last year that the Times revealed that he had also negotiated a huge uh, 187 million taxpayer loan from the property company Delancey, uh, which was the largest amount of money ever awarded by Homes England. And he didn't, he failed to mention and he failed, failed to declare that he was being paid by Delancey at the same time as he was, as he was advising on this. Um, and it turns out in 2014, while he was at City Hall, uh, Edward Lister had signed off the sale of the Olympic Village to Delancey for 275 million less than it had cost the taxpayers to build. So you get a kind of sense of the forces that have been instrumental in Wandsworth's local government. Um, and then it's no surprise why the multi-billion pound regeneration that has been dominating my kind of life in the borough um, and along our riverside uh, is, is kind of taking place and looks the way that it does. Uh, some of you may have seen on social media the infamous sky pool in Nine Elms. Um, and I think it really goes to show, and I think, you know, linking it to what we're discussing today, it goes to show the power in local government and the ones of Tories have really used their power to shape the borough and, you know, basically fight for the interests that they care about. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Nine Elms. Nine Elms is a patch of land along the River Thames, um, and it has the historic Battersea Power Station development site on it. Um, and for kind of years and years and years, it had been a kind of brownfield land that had been uh, kind of left to rot, really, um, industrial land. And this is when, you know, when London uh, and, you know, taxi drivers wouldn't cross the river to come to places like Battersea because they thought it was too rough. And uh, there were kind of loads of different plans to regenerate the area and create a new, a new scheme. Um, and as someone who cares about housing and who has a housing brief, this was a historic opportunity to build the kind of homes that Londoners need. You know, you've got zone two brownfield land. And uh, what happened is that the 2008 financial crash kind of derailed a lot of the plans that the council had had when Edward Lister was in charge. Um, and the great fear was that no one would ever build on this land. And so uh, the council decided to uh, put millions and millions of pounds of taxpayer money that would usually go on affordable housing into building the Nine Elms tube link uh, as a kind of carrot to developers to make sure that they would build in this part of this part of London. And so what we're seeing along the riverside is a, is a regeneration and a development that will basically produce historic low levels of affordable housing at a time in which the city probably needs it more than it ever has. Um, and it's kind of like a historic example of the kind of decisions that can be made in local government that can drastically affect thousands and thousands of people's lives. So instead of the 35% that you're expected to get on affordable housing on a private development, the Conservatives Council artificially lowered that to 14% so that developers would feel more encouraged to come and develop. And the argument was that the kind of financial crash meant that developers were not going to be building and they wouldn't have an incentive. And so they needed to have all this kind of like subsidies in order to encourage them. Now, of course, the absolute opposite happened. 2008 financial crisis meant that uh, quantitative easing to try and protect the economy created a huge asset boom. And we're kind of living with the ramifications of that. You know, housing in Wandsworth went up from 2014 to 2019. It's gone up by, I think it was 26%, uh, 23 or I think it's 23 or 26%. Like how many of you uh, in your own kind of, you know, in your own savings account are getting that kind of return on your money? Of course you're not. Well, that's the kind of return you can get if you invest in housing as an asset. And so you end up with this inc incredible asset boom that transforms a kind of entire neighborhood where people have lived for generations and they're building homes that nobody can afford. Um, Currently, we have 3,500 children who are homeless in, in Wandsworth at the moment. Um, we have 
that, that, that has gone up every every single year for 10 years, for a decade, uh, based on you know national policy decisions uh, uh, made by conservative government and local policy decisions made by local conservative government. Um, so how do we change this? How do we how do we how do we transform and uh, and and undo what has basically been 44 years of kind of systemic uh, uh, privatization and neoliberalism by local authority? Well, we have like an incredible manifesto, and I'm going to put into the chat after I finish speaking the specific kind of housing section on this, which are our plans around how we can really basically pipeline and funnel social housing back into the back into the developers pipeline um, because for a long time affordable housing has meant that the actual homes that get built are not necessarily social homes social rent homes or council homes um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to build a thousand council homes on council land currently a thousand homes are planned to be built on council land but only 442 of those are actually going to be council the rest are going to be market rent to help pay for it or shared ownership, uh, intermediate rent. And we think because of the nature of the crisis we face, this is a crisis that is so significant and the number of people who are homeless, you know, 3,500 kids, uh, that we need to really prioritize social housing. Um, so we're gonna build council home on council land. Public land should be used for public housing. Uh, it's a really important principle for us. Um, but what are those private renters who are being totally squeezed, who probably aren't gonna be able to access council housing? Well, we've got a huge package of measures for them as well. One of the kind of most important things uh, that we face in terms of like casework is, you know, renters being screwed over by landlords who don't pay back their deposits, who um, don't get repairs done quickly. We're going to use the council to set up an in-house bespoke service that helps private renters to fight those, those, those problems when they come up. Use the power of the council, use that soft power. It might have not have legislative power, but to try and enforce, to set up landlord licensing to make sure that, you know, we have a gold standard in the, in, in the, in the borough. Um, there's a kind of whole host of policies that um, local local councils can do, and it's about you know to be real. There's a you know there's a, you know there, there are lots and lots of constraints, but the kind of the most exciting thing about being a socialist involved in municipal government is coming up with those creative ideas that empower local people to think about what it is that they can you know that they can expect and demand of their local authority, and then getting that put into action. Um, so to just to wrap up, you know, four years ago, we won the popular vote in Wandsworth. Um, we missed out on taking the council by 143 votes, and that was spread over four wards. Uh, last year, we won a by-election by one vote. Like, literally, we won a by-election by one vote. So bodies on the ground are what are really, really needed if we're to win this council and be able to put into, put into action the kind of manifesto and pledges that we're standing on. Um, I know it's a really difficult time for a lot of Labour Party members. It can feel quite a kind of dispiriting time because of the kind of political situation that faces us. But for me, it's like the ideas and the practice of what I can do to the to the neighbourhood I grew up in, to the communities that I, you know, that every single every single day I get an email from someone who's in overcrowded accommodation, from someone who's being served at Section Twenty One is going to be being made homeless, and those are the things that can really they can push out a lot of the noise. It can make us feel quite despondent and get us to focus on what can we actually do to transform the neighborhoods um so i think it's quite an exciting time i know that if you go on twitter you feel like the world is kind of collapsing but actually in terms of organizing and candidates and local government it's a really really i have to say it's a very strong time for the left and for progressive ideas so i'm, I'm hoping that people can feel a bit of energy around that um, and, and get involved because we've got about a month to go um, but that is my time done, and um, thank you very much for, for hosting me. Thanks so much, Aiden, and thanks for that reminder that Twitter is not the world, and in fact, um, what the real world is all about organising with your comrades on the ground, and, <clears throat> and there's still so much work to be done, and, and also for the reminder that the margins can be so slim that just knocking on five doors can make a difference, so um, that's really inspiring to hear, as well as your impress the impressive work you're doing on housing justice, so thanks so much for joining us. <clears throat> Now, um, I know that Momentum members will be out there working to get you elected and to turn that council red. Um, and I also know you have to shoot, shoot off soon to a council meeting, so thank you for taking the time. Um, so next up, we'll be hearing from Matt White, who's standing for re-election um, Haringey Council, alongside well over a dozen brilliant socialists, and who Momentum is also backing for the NEC councillor position, alongside Anissa Akbar. Matt, welcome. 
Thank you very much, Gaia, and uh, thanks for, for inviting me to say a little bit about uh, what we've been doing in Haringey and um, uh, the campaign for uh, for the NEC councillor positions. So um, my name's Matt White. Uh, I'm a councillor in Haringey, which is a borough in North London. Uh, it's it's a borough of quite some quite stark divisions, really. Um, so we've got areas like Tottenham and Wood Green in the east of the borough that have some of the poorest uh, uh, um, areas in, in, in the country, really. And that really contrasts with some of the areas in places like Highgate and Muswell Hill, which, which have some of the richest uh, areas in, in, in the country. So it's, it's really a borough of stark di di divisions. Um, I was first elected as a councillor in 2018 alongside many great socialists on a pr platform of quite radically changing the approach of Haringey's Labour Council, particularly in regard to housing policy and how uh, council services are delivered. Uh, as a Labour Party member, I was part of the campaign against the, the then planned Haringey Development Vehicle or HDV. Uh, that was a campaign that gained a bit of national attention at the time. Now the HDV was a plan by the then Labour Council to effect effectively privatise the council's housing stock and commercial, commercial property by transferring it to a joint development vehicle owned 50% by the council and 50% by a multinational developer, Lend Lease. That would have ensured that the profits from redeveloping council-owned land would have been transferred out of public hands and out of the local com community and in fact overseas for decades to come. The then Haringey Labour Council also had a, a preference for acting as a commissioning council. In other words, rather than delivering local services itself as the democratically elected local government, just acting as a commissioning body, periodically deciding which private company to sign a contract with to deliver those services, again, transferring the money paid by residents as council sacks out of public hands into the private sector and often out of the local economy as well. So in the 2018 local elections, a coalition of socialists and other Labour Party members who were opposed to the HDV joined forces and through a successful campaign in the, uh, the selection process for council candidates ended up with a majority on Haringey's ruling Labour group. Since 2018, as well as cancelling the HDV, forming an internal housing delivery team and beginning the first significant council house building programme in decades with an initial target of a thousand council homes, Haringey's moved from the commissioning model to a policy of preferring our services to be delivered in-house. We've also become an accredited London living wage employer, expanded our council tax reduction scheme and eligibility for free school meals, made significant process in progress rather in decarbonising the investments of our £1.2 billion pension fund, appointed a cabinet member with responsibility for community wealth building and loads more. None of this of course would have been possible without having a Labour council in power in the first place, nor would it have been possible without getting a significant number of socialists selected as candidates and elected as councillors. We've still got a lot to do though, as we need to ensure the council house building programme doesn't stop at the first thousand homes, but continues with the next thousand, the next thousand and so on. And some of the biggest contracts for like waste, for example, and leisure remain outsourced. So we need to keep Haringey on the municipal socialism path by getting as many socialists as possible elected to the council. Despite the many dif difficulties we've faced, we've had some good success this time around, getting socialists selected in winnable seats. And it looks like there'll be a good number of great socialists on Haringey Council once more after the elections. So the prospects for pushing forward municipal socialism in Haringey are good. But in order to do this, we have to build coalitions based around particular issues. So this brings me on to the NEC campaign. Alongside fantastic whole city councillor Anissa Akbar, I'm standing for the Labour's NEC again this year, backed by Momentum and the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour councillors. Anissa and I are standing for the two positions that represent Labour councillors. Two years ago, I stood alongside Wirral councillor Joe Bird, gaining around 30% of the vote. Not bad against incumbents that have got a real national profile. Those incumbent, incumbents, Nick Forbes, who's the, um, or was until recently, the leader of Newcastle Council, and Alice Perry from Islington, are standing down this time. So Anissa and I are hoping to do better this time, especially as we're the only candidates to declare so far. We're standing on a five point programme for Labour policy and local government. First of all, is our strong support for community wealth building and insourcing. So uh, Matt Brown is going to talk in more detail later on about community wealth building. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing about from, from Matt, but just wanted to say that 
an agenda that involves reorganizing the local economy to give our communities more ownership of the wealth that's generated in their area, backing local small and medium enterprises, backing social enterprises, cooperatives and community businesses. It's a good agenda over which to build a coalition with people who might not consider themselves to be on the hard left of the labor spectrum, to, to, to build a coalition that, 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 we, that will support a, a kind of a municipal socialism that we can put into practice in, um, in labor authorities. Similarly, in sourcing services that have been contracted out to the private sector over the decades, we can argue will improve the quality of local services ensure better local democratic accountability and give workers that deliver those services better paying conditions. So our second pledge is on housing and we're supporting the building of council homes at council rents. The number of people who lack a secure and affordable home continues to rise. More and more people have no option but to rent privately, have no prospects of ever being able to own their own home and pay a huge proportion of their income to live in poorly maintained homes. Likewise, lacking uh, council owned homes to house our temporary and emergency uh, tenants, councils spend huge sums to house some of our most vulnerable residents, often in disgusting conditions, in homes owned by private landlords who profit from the misery caused by the housing crisis. We're standing for Labour councils doing all they can to build the homes our residents need, and that is explicitly council homes at council rent, not so called affordable homes. Thirdly, we're calling for real respect for council workers. Many council workers face poor working conditions, discrimination and insecure employment. We want to see an end to zero hours contracts and fire and rehire in Labour councils. We want to see Labour councils working with trade unions to ensure council workers enjoy the wages, security and dignity they deserve. We also want to see all Labour councils encouraging their staff to join unions and to employ their staff directly rather than through agencies. Our fourth pledge, is to oppose racism and discrimination in all its forms. The overt and structural racism and other forms of discrimination we sadly still see in our society is unfortunately reflected in our councils. This sees many residents, particularly young people, alienated from the authorities, whether that's the police or local government. We're taking a firm stance against all forms of discrimination, bullying, harassment and abuse. And personally, I was proud to be part of a majority BAME council leadership that began the process of looking at the naming of our roads and our parks. Uh, and we began, we began the process of renaming so-called Black Boy Lane in Tottenham. And we also renamed the park after Oliver Tambo. Our fifth and final point is on climate change. Again, I think this is a key point for building a coalition. Uh, socialists and environmentalists have the same enemy, an economic system that not only exploits the planet's resources, leaving, leading to environmental catastrophe, but it also exploits the working class, leading to insecure work, low pay and overpriced, poor quality and insecure housing. On the left, we need to make fighting climate change and the system that's leading to environmental catastrophe a central part of our platform. Local councils have a key role in helping to fight climate change, particularly in making council homes energy efficient, helping private homeowners to insulate their properties, finding ways to recycle and reuse more of what we throw away, and enabling our residents to walk and cycle more and drive less. We hope that with this programme we can show that in power, in local authorities around the country, Labour councils are able to make transformative change happen in their communities and in so doing pave the way for a general election victory for Labour. So that's all for me, thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to hearing from the remaining speakers, so um, thanks everyone. Thank you so much Matt, it's really great to hear from you. Um, I just wanted to make a small housekeeping announcement. So I understand that the comment section is not working on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube and you'd like to make, um, like ask a question, please just um, go over to Facebook, to the Momentum Facebook page, and you can ask questions in the comments under the streaming on Facebook. And apologies for that inconvenience. So I just was thank, would like to thank again, um, Aiden and Matt for their excellent contributions. They've really highlighted some of the big issues such as privatization, the selling off of council assets to predatory buyers and outsourcing. And these are the kinds of things that socialist councillors across the country are currently fighting and trying to reverse. As well as putting forward positive actions such as divesting from local pension funds, from lo divesting local pension funds from fossil fuels and uh, pushing for community wealth building. 
Um, there are dozens of inspiring manifestos that are going out now in the council elections that we can bring into action now. And that is why getting involved in the council elections is so exciting and vital. Um, I also just wanted to thank Matt for outlining his proposals that he and Anissa will be doing for the NEC that are also incredibly important at the national level to support um, council agendas on the ground. Um, it's great to see community wealth building, fair housing, fair employment, taking on racism and the climate crisis all in there. It's a very strong platform. Um, and this is so important because we've talked a lot about getting socialists elected, but equally important is what we do once we're in power and what they're supported to do. Uh, and Matt and Anissa will push for this if elected to the NEC. So we are now going to hear from two inspirational socialist leaders who've been pioneering community wealth building on the ground. First up is Joe Cullinan, who's joining us from North Ayrshire, where he's actually just been out pounding the streets um, for the elections. Joe is a Labour councillor there and the leader of the council, which has been doing amazing things to push the cause of municipal socialism. I'll let Joe tell you all about it. Thanks for joining us, Joe. Okay, thanks, uh, Guy. And as you say, I've uh, ran off the, the campaign trail uh, to join you tonight. So been pounding the streets of North Ayrshire every day for the last few uh, weeks and getting a good response, as to be said, around the sort of transformative uh, agenda that we've been pursuing uh, in power over the last five years. Great to join you on the day that you've uh, you launched your community wealth building toolkit, so massive uh, well done to everybody involved in that from Momentum, but also the Democracy Collaborative, Joe Gwynion, and Neil McEnroy, etc. So really great work because I think that community wealth building uh, certainly gives us in North Ayrshire the frame towards how we want to create a new economy which is more democratically and socially owned and it does uh, frame everything that we now do as a Labour uh, council and certainly what we are talking about in this election is part of our uh, re-election campaign. In North Ayrshire uh, over the last five years, we've been delivering the, the most ambitious council house and investment programme in the whole of Scotland. So we're building 1,625 council houses uh, across every ward in North Ayrshire, including on one of our islands, uh, the Isle of Arran, where we've built the first council houses uh, on the island for uh, decades. The previous houses were transferred to a housing association and we've reintroduced council house into the island uh, for the first time in, in many, many years. We're also uh, upgrading sheltered housing complexes for older people, but we're also uh, investing in a, a really ambitious retrofitting programme. Uh, so we've installed uh, solar panels onto existing council houses and we've plans to take the number of uh, council houses with those solar panels up to over 6,000 over the next term. So that's reducing uh, tenants' energy bills, but also cutting carbon emissions as well. In terms of renewable energy, uh, we are uh, transforming two of our former landfill sites into council-owned solar farms, and we have just approved the outline business case for another renewable energy programme, which will see a further three wind turbines and another solar farm at one of our industrial sites uh, in North Ayrshire. These are all council-owned renewable energy projects. This isn't selling off uh, our renewable energy potential, like the SNP and Green Government did with uh, Scotland's offshore wind potential. This is council owned, it's publicly owned, the benefits are locked in for our communities uh, and it will see an income generated for the council that we are then looking to, to reinvest in a sort of transformative programme to tackle fuel poverty, improving the energy efficiency of uh, uh, more of our residents' homes and all house centennials, looking at how we can invest that money in further renewable energy projects including battery storage etc. And we're also looking at how we can maybe use a proportion of it to start funding uh, the development of new cooperatives, uh, worker-owned businesses and more socially owned businesses in general. We are looking at how we do regeneration differently as well. I think every community up and down the country is suffering from uh, vacant and derelict sites. We've seen uh, the number of vacant properties increase over the pandemic and some of your high streets are in desperate need of uh, revitalisation. And I am not a, a leader of a council who wants to see regeneration, town centre regeneration being superficial about being fancy paving stones in communities. I want to see it being about thriving communities, 
creating town centre housing, creating space for communities, creating social enterprise hubs, etc. in our town centres. So we've set out plans over the last week to create a high street buyout fund. And we're going to use that fund to try and bring more of these vacant and derelict sites into council and common ownership over the next uh, term. That's the type of agenda that we are taking out into the streets in North Ayrshire over the last few weeks and we'll take out into the streets over the next three weeks as we get to Poland Day on the 5th of May. It's really important, I think, that we continue to run North Ayrshire Council and set the political agenda in Scotland. Uh, not only have we been leading on stuff like community in Scotland, but we've also been the first council to do things like uh, provide free sanitary products in all our schools and uh, public buildings, which was then uh, rolled out across the country. We've also been the first council to install mental health counsellors in all our secondary schools, supporting young people with their mental health and well-being. We were the first council to care experienced young people from council tax and all of these sort of initiatives that we've started out delivering in North Ayrshire have then been rolled out at a national level. And I think that shows the influence that we can have Labour and local government when we've got socialist uh, values, the political in May's election. So please, if you are able to uh, come up to, to Scotland and spend a, a couple of hours with us, uh, please do so. We'd really appreciate your support. Unlike the next speaker, who has quite rightly been rewarded over the last few elections around uh, his uh, sort of record uh, in Preston, uh, North Ayrshire is up against the nationalism of the SNP and the Conservatives in Scotland, and it's a more difficult nut to break. So we would really appreciate everyone being able to uh, come up to Scotland and support us in North Ayrshire, keep North Ayrshire red. So anything you can do in terms of campaigning and volunteering would be really uh, greatly appreciated. And also we have a crowdfunder, uh, which we've been sharing on social media. So any donations will go to select, uh, electing uh, socialist Labour councillors in North Ayrshire as well. So thanks, Gaia. I, uh, I know that's been a whistle-stop tour. I'm just uh, in off the campaign trail and I'm going to be working all uh, hours during the night getting the next round of leaflets finished but thanks very much uh, evening and well done again on the toolkit thanks so much joe and thanks for your help with the toolkit as well and um for joining us though i know you're like super super busy right now and there's a lot going on um and the work that you're doing is just so trailblazing and inspiring and and i think also just wanted to highlight that north Ayrshire's incredibly inspiring program shows how we can make the Green New Deal happen here and now and gives us a great example of what that looks like. Um, and as Joe said, Momentum will be running a campaign day in North Ayrshire on the 23rd of April. Um, we'll be flashing up an email address either now or later on in, the, um, in this streaming. So please do note that down. And if you have any questions you want to get involved, just email us um, for, for, for opportunities um, in North Ayrshire or other ones to go canvassing for some of these really incredible leaders and so we can support them. So yeah, if you're free on the 23rd of April, no matter where you are, take a train up, you know, it'll be a great, a great way to experience and get to know what they're doing on the ground as well as, as supporting the campaign. I really, really recommend you consider doing that. Um, so um, as, um, as we've been talking throughout the, um, the evening, we're pushing um, a community wealth building. A lot of us, Joe's been um, doing it, Matt White mentioned it. And um, if you've heard of the Preston model, it's been one of the shining examples of that. We're now going to be hearing um, from one of its architects, the Labour Council leader, Matthew Brown. Matthew is going to talk a bit about his work in Preston and also about the toolkit and how we can put it to good use. Um, it may be that Matthew's not quite with us yet. So what we will do is while Matthew is signing in, we're going to go to uh, my comrade and sister, uh, Momentum's National Secretary, Shonley Bhattacharya, who's uh, also a very active member of Waltham Forest Momentum. And um, she's going to tell us about how as a left, we can complement the good work of elected officials by building vibrant movements in our communities. Brilliant. Yeah, thanks, Gaia. Uh, thanks, everyone, for putting on this brilliant call today. Um, so we've heard, heard from great 
fantastic council a council up in, in in North Ayrshire. They're really inspiring. Um, but at Momentum, we're also keen to stress the importance of building movement power from the ground up to support councils to feel confident enough to pursue bold strategies like community wealth building and to hold them to account when they're failing their local communities, whether that is a Labour or Tory council. That's why at Momentum, we're focusing more resources than ever on our local groups, providing them with critical support um, and financial resources so that they can campaign effectively in their communities as well as inside the party. And that's whether they're defending people losing their homes or protesting the closure of vital public services inflicted by Tory austerity. Um, in my own area of Waltham Forest, as Gaia mentioned, uh, we've been standing with our local community um, and that uh, have, has at times meant that we've had to challenge a Labour Council. Uh, at the moment, Waltham Forest Council is not doing enough to help homeless people find housing locally, including in the private rented sector. The statistics are really quite bleak at the moment. Most homeless families in Waltham Forest are single parent households, mainly single mothers. Women are twice as likely to be in temporary accommodation than men, and black, Asian and ethnic minority people are 50% more likely to be in homeless temporary accommodation than white people. To tackle this crisis head on, we've got together and got active in the here and now. Uh, Dan, if it's, if it's possible to have the first slide, that would be great. Um, so as part of a coalition including Wealth and Forest Momentum, uh, the local London Renters Union branch, um, East London Unite Community, uh, Cooperation Town, who are a local food co-op, um, and mutual aid activists and the Trades Council, we have stopped two evictions, are supporting two families who've been forced out of the borough, including utilising the mutual aid network to furnish an empty flat that one family was forced to accept miles away um, from their previous residence and their work. We've effectively pressurised the council and, and the local MP, and we've managed to keep one family so far, everything crossed, in Walthamstone. Uh, can we have the next slide, please, Dan? So far, the campaign has successfully drawn attention to families forced out of the borough at a local and national level, but there's still loads of work to do to raise the political point about social cleansing being a policy choice, even if the Tories continue to defund local councils across the country. This is where the vital position of Momentum members becomes clear. We are able to pressure our Labour councillors and MPs and introduce and promote transformational socialist ideas into our CLPs with the knowledge that we bring from our struggle in the movement. Working with trade union branches, tenants unions, anti-racist groups and civil society organisations helps build support and capacity for these vital struggles, struggles in our communities and inside the party. Uh, can I have the next slide, please, Dan? Next weekend, our, uh, sorry, last weekend, our coalition organised a hugely successful community resilience event, our first as Waltham Forest Together which saw trade union branches, tenants unions, anti-racist organisations and groups organising around food security working together to extend the conversation about social cleansing in the borough and help build a movement for this vital struggle. Uh, can I have the next slide please, Dan? The challenge for our coalition now is to imagine an alternative local plan, one based on democratic principles and rooted in economic, climate and racial justice. Uh, can I have the next slide please? Places like Preston and North Ayrshire provide examples and community wealth building offers, offers a toolkit to build our local campaign in Waltham Forest into a propositional one as well as an oppositional one. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, the energy, enthusiasm and will already exist, as you can hopefully see. We hope an effective local movement building campaign will also empower socialist councillors to progress an alternative vision for our borough. Uh, final slide, please. This is the long-term work needed to build socialism from the ground up, but we know from the inspirational examples we've heard about today that we can be successful. The more we're able to share ideas and best practice, the stronger we will be. Um, and that's why this new toolkit for Momentum is going to be so important. It gives us a, a benchmark to look, to look at and to, and to share from and hopefully coordinate us across the country. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Shanley. That was fantastic and really inspiring. Um, we will now go to Matthew Brown from Preston. Thanks so much for joining us today, Matthew. I know you've, you've had a busy night. Yeah, hi. Great. It's great to be here, Gaia. Um, lovely to be part of this, uh, this broadcast. Obviously, a very busy time at the moment. So, obviously, we are in the local election period. So, the position must be that we support every single Labour candidate that's standing. 
uh, because we really need to send a message to the Conservative government, especially with the cost of living crisis. And I think a lot of the issues that we're getting with the cost of living crisis is around, uh, you know, the economic model we have and especially the fact that we have you know, utilities which are basically in the hands of uh, private corporations instead of in common ownership, really. So I think, you know, it's very much linked to the kind of uh, democratic socialist agenda that we're trying to uh, put forward. So please support every single Labour candidate on May the 5th. But within Labour councils and Metro Mers and, uh, you know, beyond, there is a really interesting conversation about how we can move to a really creative, forward thinking municipal socialism. So obviously, the likes of myself and, uh, uh, Joe in North Ayrshire, you know, we, we've been instrumental in that conversation. But crucially, the ideas that we got, it didn't come from uh, necessarily the UK. A lot of it came from uh, international examples of alternative economics like Mondragon in Spain, which was actually established with the help of the Catholic Church in the 1930s and, and onwards. And uh, even the American Rust Belt as well, which is actually looking at more, you know, radical ideas to really promote economic, environmental and uh, social justice there and obviously deal with the racial inequalities, which are huge in America. So it's a very exciting time. Uh, we, we did last week, actually last Thursday, have our uh, local election campaign launch. Our manifesto will be out uh, very soon. And at that launch, we had Grace Blakely, Ed Miliband and Dave Ward from the Communication Workers Union. Our local MP, Mark, was there as well. Uh, myself and many fantastic local candidates. So we got 17 candidates standing that are really hungry to really transform Preston. And obviously there's, there's a lot mentioned about Preston, but we're not that dissimilar to many places, especially in the north of England, because we've had a dynamic within Preston. And if we go back decades, you know, back in the 60s, 70s, and even to a degree 80s, we had very well-paid uh, manufacturing jobs. And it's been the imposition of Thatcherism uh, in the 80s and a similar kind of neoliberal economic model that hasn't really been challenged intellectually, which has seen, uh, you know, really big increases in inequality and deprivation and other things within our community. And it's very much the same everywhere else, to be honest. So people have had a really hard time, haven't they, haven't they in the last few decades? So obviously we've had that form of economics, which was probably the most extreme within uh, Europe, you know, the European Union, former European Union. We then had the financial crisis of 2007-8. Obviously, the payback from that was austerity. We've had a hard Brexit and now the worst public health crisis since World War Two. So, I mean, my own view is I think people, you know, really want some transformative change. I think there really is a, a desire for that. And I think locally, we've got to really try to pick up on that mood because the danger is if we don't, others might take advantage of it. And I think we've got to do that. And I think we can start doing that locally. The amount of Labour councils across the, you know, across the spectrum within the Labour Party that are taking on community wealth building, obviously, Momentum is obviously behind it, but there's a co-op party unions and others that are. So you're getting a broad spectrum of opinion that, yes, it's from the radical left, but it appeals beyond it, to be honest. So it's a very exciting movement to be part of. In terms of policy, a few things we've done in Preston, and I've told the story many times, but obviously things around working with our big institutions, getting them accredited with the real living wage, ensure we spend a lot more with locally based companies, get apprentices in there and other social value outcomes as well. Local investment by the council and uh, its partners of the public sector pension fund, new affordable housing. That is a lot of the, you know, the grounding that we've done within Preston because there's been a huge amount of public wealth by ourselves and our big institutions like our universities, university and hospital that's been, you know, brought back into our local community to support local businesses and local jobs. But now we're on to the, the stuff that really is very transformative. So we've registered five new worker owned businesses, we've insourced services back into the local authority, we've incubated a new regional cooperative bank, and we're working on that. We're um, we're going to have £70 million worth of city centre redevelopment that's going to be done primarily in local public ownership. So, for example, there's going to be a, a cinema stroke level, leisure development with the asset owned by the local public sector. Uh, we're looking to establish a community land trust, which will be one of the first in, in central Lancashire. Uh, you know, we're even looking to work with our partners in, you know, potentially the NHS and our anchor institutions to generate energy in the local public by the local public sector. We we'll look at cooperative energy as well. And then in addition, we're looking at things that are really practical, like saying to our NHS, can you re recruit people in the areas with the highest levels of deprivation? 
and target that on a you know, female members of the community and minority members of the community that are disproportionately affected by poverty. All that is going on within Preston, and it's very exciting at the moment to be part of that. But this is a hard, tough struggle. So obviously, you know, we're committed as a Labour Council to really finish the job off and bring about that transformation, to be honest. But obviously, the toolkit is very exciting because, you know, I did play, uh, you know, a somewhat limited role in that being put together. But in terms of the you know, very sensible, practical socialism within that. So in terms of what we're trying to do around progressive procurement, insourcing, ownership of the economy, looking at who owns land, making sure that's in a lot more hands, it's a really real practical guide to actually uh, take this agenda forward. And it's nothing to scare people off. It's very, very practical in terms of where we are politically and economically, because as I said earlier, we need some transformative change within our communities. But again, the community wealth building movement is been taken forward by so many Labour authorities now. So obviously, Joe has been an inspiration in North Ayrshire. Uh, there's obviously Metro mayors like Steve Rotherham, Andy Burnham and Jamie Driscoll that are implementing it just down the road in Wirral. We've got Jan Williamson, who's standing on a very strong uh, community wealth building agenda. But what I think is probably the most exciting thing is that this is a huge international movement now that even the, uh, the Biden administration is... Uh, listening to. So in American cities, for example, you've got Philadelphia, which is looking at having a publicly owned bank rather than being uh, dependent on the, you know, the large corporate banks that dominate so much in America. Uh, Chicago has launched a, a citywide community wealth building strategy uh, to deal with mainly with the racial injustices that you see there. You've got New York that's looking at, uh, you know, work with employee ownership. Atlanta, San Francisco is looking at a publicly owned bank. So there's a kind of architecture which moves beyond, uh, you know, beyond countries in the sense that, you know, the kind of economics they've had in America has actually been worse than ours. And they're actually looking locally and regionally. Democratic Party, and it's mainly progressive Democrats, but the Democratic Party and others, uh, to look at more radical solutions that are looking at ownership of the economy and controlling the wealth within local communities. So obviously, you know, organisations like Momentum, obviously, we, we do need younger people to be, stay inspired by politics and actually play a part in politics. It's it's very important that we do have youth engagement. I think young people, obviously, compared to my generation, they really are struggling in terms of job insecurity and a lot of other issues that they're facing. Obviously, you know, tuition fees and other things they're struggling with. So it's really important that we do work with young people to get, get them behind this agenda. And I think a lot of the... Uh, the conversations about how we can move forward with a democratic socialism within uh, the UK, a lot of it's coming locally and regionally. And I think it's been like that for some years, to be honest. I think there's been very interesting dynamics and relationships have actually begun locally and regionally. So please back every Labour candidate on Thursday, May the 5th, and let's uh, look at the toolkit and see how we can really embed this within communities. So thank you so much, Gaia, for inviting me today. Really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matthew. And I might keep you on just for a second because we are now moving into our question sessions and we're just going to take a few few questions from the audience. And just to remind everyone, if you want to ask a question, please go to Facebook and put it in the comments section because comments on YouTube aren't working. So thanks for that. So, Matthew, this is a question from David Simpson, who's an activist from Portsmouth and a member of, La of the Labour Party. Um, he's saying that his activist passion is participatory budgeting and he wants to know if participatory budgeting has pay, played any role um, in Preston. Uh, the answer is no, not at this stage, just because uh, we've not, austerity has meant we've not had that much money to participate with. It's something we'd like to do. The participation we have done really is around uh, bringing in new economic models and looking at how we can uh, participate economically. Uh, by the various policies that I mentioned just uh, a few minutes ago. Obviously, we'd love to do something like that, but the reality is, is that, uh, you know, austerity has been a real killer, especially for working class communities like ours in the north. And obviously, we took the decision we did around community wealth bill and just because we wanted to try and move beyond that as far as we could uh, by working with other institutions and looking at bringing new models of uh, ownership into the economy. It does take time, but that's the way that we've done it, really. So obviously, we'd love to do that. And if we do get a Labour government soon, let's hope we do. And, uh, you know, the amount councils get in, does increase. We'll look at doing something like that. But by the time being, it's really the policies that I mentioned so far. Brilliant. Thank you so much again, Matthew, for joining us tonight and for all the work that you're doing uh, on behalf of the movement. 
So our second question, I, I might bring on Matt White. Let's have two Matts in a row. Um, thanks for joining us, Matt. Um, so this one is about constraints. Um, what constraints do progressive councils and authorities come up against in terms of their power in relation to national government? And how can we work within and possibly beyond those constraints? Don't know if you have any thoughts on that. <clears throat> uh, Matt, you I don't know if you've frozen or... Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of half hearing what you're saying. It's it's I, I don't know whether it's my connection. I'm no, uh, I, I can see you. I can see you now, hear, so maybe we did, can try again. I did hear the question. You did hear the question. I did hear the question about the constraints um, um, on councils regarding uh, uh, what, what, what we're able to do, particularly constraints put by national government. And I suppose the biggest constraint, I don't know if people can hear me because I'm, I'm the, <laughs> the picture of myself I can see is, is fl flicking in and out. But anyway, I'll, 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 I'll keep trying. So the, the, the biggest constraint is obviously down to funding and, and the massive cuts that have been imposed on us over the last uh decade and and, and and more um so i suppose i suppose that's that's the biggest the biggest problem we're, we're we're constantly trying to find savings which in in uh a lot of cases has meant cuts but obviously what we need to do is 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 find kind of more uh creative ways of delivering services to make sure that the that the the services particularly those services that we're um delivering for our our, our poorer more vulnerable residents aren't impacted as um or at least minimally impacted by 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 the uh by, by the cuts from central government we have to do things in um in, in more innovative ways by by generating uh income um by finding ways to to, to do things more efficiently uh obviously insourcing um we're finding is is actually managing to save money for us so that so that, that that's a bonus but it's not just about the money actually um there's, there's there's other constraints that we're finding um uh i mean we've we've recently uh been discussing in 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 haringey how we deal with our waste uh and and the the plans to uh build a huge new incinerator next to the um the north circular which uh will incinerate a large proportion of our uh, of, of the, the waste we generate um uh the issue we've got with that is is um i mean this is this is something that's kind of a a, a big problem for london local authorities uh it's the, the the kind of the consequences of the dissolution of the greater london council back in the 1980s and and the fact that the powers the way powers are distributed between uh local authorities like haringey uh and the the greater london authority and the mayor it, it doesn't necessarily seem to work that well and when it comes to deciding you know a, a long-term strategy on how we deal with our waste this is actually decided ultimately by waste authorities which have councillors on the, the 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 board that makes the decision but those councillors don't act in accordance with the, the 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 kind of political policy of the councils that they're on they're required to act in the kind of commercial sometimes interests of the waste authority itself which actually generates a profit by um burning waste and generating electricity and selling that electricity onto the grid so um if, if we wanted to to question that as, as a labor council that 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 you know we're, we're we're incinerating a large proportion of our waste and actually maybe we need to look at more ways of uh um uh um uh, recycling more you know reusing more composting more uh it's not actually within our power very very easily anyway to, to, to influence that because of the way the kind of governance arrangements for waste have been set up following the dissolution of the greater london council we've got similar problems uh, when it comes to um, pension funds, like pension funds in London are, you know, in the context of pension funds, uh, local government pension funds I'm talking about, in the context of pension fund, public sector pension funds 
globally are actually quite small. It might sound like a huge amount of money that the Haringey Pension Fund is 1.2, 1.3 billion pounds, but that's actually really quite, quite small. And that's a consequence of the, the, the Greater London Pension Fund being split up into 32 different pension funds in, 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 in the 1980s. And, and there's not much we can do as an individual council to, to change that. So I think, you know, we need, really need to um, put pressure on, uh, um, personally, I would like to see uh, the Greater London Council and the powers of the Greater London Council coming back in, 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 into existence in some form by, by increasing the powers of the, uh, uh, the Greater London Authority. That might not make me very popular among uh, my um, fellow uh, London borough councillors, but I think there's many, many. I mean, I've just mentioned two, uh, two aspects of that. But there, there are many, many uh, ways in which the kind of distribution of powers don't seem very, very, uh, very well designed. And I think it's just a bit of a haphazard way of, of, of running things. Thanks so much, Matt. That was that was great. Very comprehensive answer. Um, I've got a question here from John Maltman, which I'll paraphrase, but um, I'm and I'll. I'm going to shoot this to Shunali um, because it's about sort of like uh, grassroots members and what they can do. So while the toolkit looks great, it's aimed at local councillors. What can Labour members do to help bring about this vision? Shunali, would you like to have a go at that? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. Um, I mean, first of all, I guess that the, the one thing that we all, all need to have in our, at our disposal in our arsenal is a, a rebuttal to the ongoing refrain that austerity means councils have no choice but to enact social cleansing in our communities and other policies that destroy working class people's lives. Um, our comrade there just mentioned the Edmonton incinerator, for instance. So, first of all, it's really important that we have um, we have the confidence to be able to say no. Actually, there is another way. It's hard. No one's going to pretend it's not a slog, but actually, that there is an alternative. Um, and I guess, secondly, um, for us as activists, so much of what we're striving for uh, is enabling this vision of a better world. How can we imagine a better world? Um, and that starts on our doorstep. It's much more tangible if we can think about that in our communities. Um, it starts at a local level. It's something that we can grasp. Um, to see that an alternative isn't just possible, it's actually sensible and sustainable. And that really is something that we can imagine on our doorstep. So community wealth building allows us to realise that these ideas are within our grasp and to give our campaigning a tangible set of ideas um, that we can pursue um, in a very focused way um, and in a way that hopefully hopefully allows for um, you know, those small wins that add up to the big win, you know, to add, that add up to just a, a better, more equal, um, you know, like daily life for ourselves. Um, so I think those are the key things. It's about really, you know, giving us a, a better framework, a, a greater focus um, and a more tangible vision for what we're striving for. Thanks so much, Shanali. And I, I'd just like to add that I think for us in Momentum, uh, John's question is something that we find very interesting and we're, we're looking at. And um, what, what I would like to see is a sort of follow up, up activity to this, where we have a toolkit for how to organize for community wealth in your community. And I think there are many things that, that we on the ground can do, even if we're not in a council. We could organize campaigns asking for the the sort of pillars of community wealth building. We could be organizing for sort of uh, local cooperative banks. We can be organizing for um, building worker-owned co-ops in, in our communities and, and to, to sort of campaign for, for bringing um, outsourced services back to insourcing. So I, I think there could actually be a really rich strain of activist activity around community wealth building to really support our councillors who are fighting for them within the council and to support them from outside and I think that's something that we together with all of you can can sort of help build. So for my final question I'm going to bring on uh, Matthew Brown again. This is a question from oh there's uh, this is this is a question from Stanislaw Perps who is asking uh, the question how do you sell community wealth building on the doorstep especially in the context where the council is yet to do any I don't know if you have any tips there. I think a lot of it is just using very common sense language, Gaia, because I think people do want to see change. Um, I don't think the people want a managerial council necessarily. Obviously, I think people need to be competent and efficient. But in terms of 
uh, the problems they're facing. They want to see a bit of hope and a bit of transformation. So a lot of it is just using very common sense terms around, you know, listen, we'll work with our big institutions to employ people in this community, you know, buy from companies in this community, small businesses, get a real living wage in their trade union recognition and other things like that. And then obviously then try to explain how, um, you know, a more shared economy through cooperative banking, you know, council ownership, worker ownership, it's something that you can all benefit from. Uh, in Preston, we have worked really strongly with our communities now and unions and others to actually bring this to scale. And it's it's working pretty well. And there's things that are emerging that actually have come out of nowhere. Like tonight, I was at a, a PAC meeting and uh, the local church is looking at a community land trust because they've heard about the Preston model. And they want to be part of it, which will then mean the community will actually own the housing development. So these things, you know, you get a culture once you start putting these ideas forward. What I did fail to say, which I forgot, but I will do now when it's linked to this, which is a really important point, is about the composite that went to Labour conference. So all our affiliate unions supported community wealth building. I think that's a huge, significant move uh, through, I think, Labour together. I think the, the vast majority were behind it. But that does mean in practical terms, the CWU were looking at uh, worker ownership in the post office if it can't be in public ownership, which obviously was was our original policy. Uh, how to support alternative banking arrangements and looking out how we can work with councils around, you know, community support in municipal in municipally owned buildings, right? So, you know, it's quite exciting where we're going with this and where we could go with this. And it potentially, I mean, if you look how the NHS was formed, it was trade union branches in Wales that were looking at some structure that would eventually be adopted by the state and become the NHS. You know, I'm not trying to say that what we're doing is of that magnitude, but there is something in the water that is pretty transformative if we get it right, really. So, I mean, I probably digressed a lot, but I think the way to sell it is that we need change. This is very common sense stuff and that we can actually find ways of actually influencing our institutions and the council and putting new structures in place that are going to benefit all of us. And I think once you do that and have a Labour Council you know, trying to influence so many other partners in the community, as well as the community itself, it becomes pretty unstoppable. Great. Thanks, Matthew. And I, I may add that using examples such as Preston on the doorstep might be useful too, just to show that it's happening and what, what's possible. Um, Definitely. Yeah. And also international examples are quite helpful as well, really, to be honest, because there's a lot of them that inspired us from overseas. Brilliant. Thanks so much again for joining us. So um, we did have a final question from um, someone called Sam Foster, who's um, asked whether there'll be an intro to the toolkit and how to use it. And just to let you know, Sam, that we will be running um, a training. This toolkit is aimed at councillors and we will be running a training for councillors starting in um, mid to late May to help them understand and understand how to use the toolkit effectively. Um, but, um, you know, again, like I said earlier, we, uh, our, our aspiration is to be doing similar sort of activities with our uh, members as well. So um, with that, I think I'm, uh, we're going to close um, the session tonight. Um, I just want to say a massive thanks to Aiden, Matt, Joe, Matthew and Shunley for joining us tonight. I also want to do a special big thanks to the Democracy Collaborative, especially Joe Guinan and Neil McEnroy, who can't be here tonight, but who've been working so hard with us over the last few months to develop the Community Wealth Building Toolkit and the training program. Uh, and one final thing I'll add just before closing is that all of the inspirational achievements we've heard about tonight have been and are being completed through the Labour Party. We've run training programs for future councillors. We've worked to get hundreds of socialists selected who are, and those socialists are now running for elections. And we are now rolling out this incredible community wealth building toolkit. So if you're not a member of Momentum, join us today. And Sam in the comments will be running that session for councillors in the toolkit soon. Uh, most importantly though, I just wanna end with this. If you have a spare weekend or day, or if you've got some leave and you can take a day off, please go out and support these and other councillors who are really putting themselves out there. Um, they can make a real change on the ground. Um, it's happening now, but it's not going to happen at the scale and the speed that we want it to without the movement behind them. So we are counting on you to support them. And this is a collective endeavour. 
So thank you so much for coming tonight. Please take note of that email that's just been flashed up on the, on the um, screen. Please write to us if you want to get involved in canvassing activities. We'd be so happy to help plug you into the, to the many, many campaigns that are happening now across the country, including North Ayrshire and the ones that Aidan and Matt, Matt uh, mentioned as well. So thank you. Um, we hope to be organizing with you on the ground soon and um, look forward to, to working with you more. Take care, everyone. <laughs>